thank you very much for inviting me. So menopause is a passion. And when you asked if I could talk for half an hour or 45 minutes, I could probably do um, a, a few days. So I'm going to just put my slideshow up and hopefully we will be able to see that. So my screen shared. So yes, I'm, I'm also, I'm a recognised menopause specialist with the British Menopause Society, who is one of the few societies that don't distinguish between nurses and medics when they're handing out if you can be a specialist or not. And I'm a tra trainer as well. So I um, have quite a lot of menopause input. So what I'm aiming to cover is um, I'm going to do a little bit about menopause at work because I think that's important for people that work within the NHS and for people that are mainly women and working with women. Um, so a little bit on that. Then I'm going to look at um, menopause diet and lifestyle alternatives and what you can be sold and what you can't be sold, complementary therapies and then a bit on HRT. And then I'm happy to take questions on anything that we need to. So if we're looking at the menopause, it's not just about the hot flushes and the night sweats. So the British Menopause Society have looked at work and menopause and 45% of people in working with menopause symptoms say it can be a struggle. There has been lots of people that have um, left jobs, cut their hours back. There have been cases of people that have gone through disciplinary procedures due to poor performance. And actually when it's reflected back, it's been related to menopause, brain fog and issues like that. We um, also it can affect social life. So people don't want to go out. They don't feel as confident. And that's not surprising if you're having hot flushes or not sleeping very well. But um, again, it can affect all the psychological things. Partners feel left out as well and helpless and don't quite know what to say. And sex can be a problem as well. And I'll cover most of those things as we go through the talk. Um, so the Faculty of Occupational Medicine has got some good handouts on menopause and um, it estimates that, that by last year, one in three British workers will be over the age of 50. So that's a lot of women working for sometimes 20 to 30 years in the menopause. Um, so it's really a time to take stock and look at your health and look at your optimum health and try and get that good and try and make sure that you are able to enjoy those years after the menopause. People say, why is this a problem now? And if you look back, if you reflect on the average lifespan, if you look back 100 years or so, uh, people would die when they got to the menopause. So it wasn't really much of an issue for them. Um, so it's becoming a more and more of an issue as women get older, live longer and then work longer as well. But on top of that, women are often unwilling to dis disclose menopausal problems. And I don't think that goes for just menopausal problems that's all of heavy periods gynae problems etc um, so there is a bit of a vicious cycle where there's lots of people suffering but they don't want to tell people why they're suffering and what they're suffering with so therefore no policies are made and no HR help is given and nothing's done through occupational health because people don't really think it's a problem um, so it goes in a cycle so the first part I would think about is speaking up and just talking about it and making it a normal discussion so that people can talk about it and feel it's a normal thing that happens as it is something that happens to every woman so menopause as an occupational health issue is quite interesting because the symptoms impact on work and sometimes work can impact on the symptoms. So the symptoms that can impact on work are obviously the hot flushes, um, forgetting words, not being able to present as well as you used to. Um, and um, some people have lots of joint pain. So for people like us that use our hands a lot, that can be quite difficult. Um, I spoke to one of the porters at work who was having really bad vaginal dryness, so much so that it was just sore. And you can imagine when she walked and you can imagine how that was uncomfortable for someone who was a porter whose main job is to walk. Um, so work can impact on symptoms and symptoms can impact on work. So it's a vicious circle and we need to try and get in there and get those symptoms sorted out. But as women make up the large part of the workforce and particularly even more within nursing and midwifery in the NHS and we work longer. Um, some people have significant, have no issues at all and just have periods stop and nothing else. Other people have significant issues um, that can be transient and can come and go. And then the other thing I'd love to highlight is that the menopause can happen at any age. So I will talk a little bit about premature ovarian insufficiency, but um, some people say, oh, you're too young for a menopause. And quite honestly, there's no one that's too young for a menopause. And we should remember that when we're looking, uh, looking at our women, looking at our um, colleagues and, and patients, etc. cetera, that, um, anyone can have a menopause at any age. Particularly relevant if we're looking as well at people that are surviving from cancer longer and some of those cancer treatments can put people into menopause. So at work, I've said hot flushes can be worse when presenting because you feel worried and then they carry on. You can't remember your words. Not sleeping can have a huge impact on people and then vaginal dryness and joint pain. So 
women with menopausal symptoms are less engaged, they're less likely to go for promotion, they're more intention to quit, more intention to um, have lower attendance and um, performance and can be misdiagnosed with mental health issues around this time as well. So it's really important that we start to promote what is normal and um, what these symptoms can be. So menopause is not an illness, and I will say with the exception of women that have an early menopause, so premature ovarian insufficiency, which is under the age of 40 and after cancer, because you're not really supposed to ha not have any hormones at that point. It's often under-recognised and undervalued and not taken seriously. And most people think that the symptoms will last for about four years or so, um, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they last a lot longer. So they can last for 10 to 15 to 20 years from the last menstrual period. Um, and... Um, it can be the psychological symptoms that generally affect women the most and are often the ones that you don't recognise until some help has been given, until people have started maybe some treatment. And then they look back and say, I just didn't feel like me or um, they feel completely different. It's common. It happens to all women in some way. It impacts on life and home wide range of the symptoms it's an emotional time and it can be made worse at work by temperatures uniforms etc not being able to get drinks not being able to go to the loo and things and it's often not talked about so our menopause definitions the average age is 51 in the uk currently and it's been that age for a while premature menopause is in the um, 45 to 50 group so that's a little bit early but not too bad and then premature ovarian insufficiency which affects about one percent of the population is under 40. And that can happen for a very varying different reasons, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, perimenopause, and this is sometimes the terms that people get muddled up with. So perimenopause is that time prior to when the periods stop completely. And it's a time of hormonal fluctuations. So they, your ovaries are um, not releasing eggs every month. Your, your body is trying to get that to happen. So the hormones fluctuate, the symptoms come and go, the periods come and go. Perimenopausal changes can start in the 40s um, and then they can be transient and they can start before um, if you did do blood tests you would notice anything on bloods. So the perimenopause is the time when the, when the symptoms are there and then they disappear and the periods come and go until we finally lead up to not having had a period for a year and then that's postmenopausal and it's always a retrospective event so there's different stages involved in the menopause and there's lots of different myths out there that you can't start HRT if you're still having periods which is wrong um, you have to wait till you stop them which is completely wrong so um, it's defined in a very medical way as a cessation of ovarian function so it's um, decreased estradiol um, increased um, FSH and LH and no periods. And menopause can be natural, so it happens naturally, but surgically, if we do um, a bilateral serpingoephorectomy, so take the ovaries out or induced with things like chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So we've got very different things. And we know that if we interfere and do things with surgery or drugs, um, the symptoms are sudden onset and much more severe than if it's, if it's a natural menopause. So POI, um, which I've said affects women under 40. Um, so it's quite a few women. There is a support network called the DAISY Network, which is a, a charity for women under 40 with menopausal issues. That is quite a good charity to signpost people to. They have a buddy system and they have lots of information as well. We know that um, POI affects many parts to people's lives. So we know that women with POI have an increased risk of death, they have an increased risk of um, fracture, an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and poor long-term mental health. So it's important that before we do anything like removal of ovaries, we talk about this as well. And we try and modify people's lifestyles. So diagnosis. If you've got symptoms and you're of the right age for menopause, we shouldn't be doing bloods. So we shouldn't be doing bloods for two reasons. One, because they don't tell us anything. Because if I picked, probably not all of you, because there's too many, but if I picked a random selection and we did bloods on us every single day for two months, we would get different reasons on every day. If we're in the perimenopause, they can wildly fluctuate. So you might have a normal reading because you have ovulated that month, still have some symptoms. And then the next month it would be high. Your FSH would be high. So they're not very helpful apart from in women under 40 just to get a diagnosis there because we need to exclude things. But the other reason is that some people have severe hot flushes, night sweats, can't sleep, joint pain. They have normal bloods and they're told they're not perimenopausal and they can't have HRT. So it can be used negatively to deny people treatment as well. So NICE have a guideline on menopause and they definitively say do not do bloods. But however, bloods are still being done, but bloods don't need to be done. 
And also I thought I'll put in here, remember contraception, because all the while you're still having some periods, there's still a chance of pregnancy. So we suggest contraception. If your periods stop bef before the age of 50, it's two years without periods on contraception. And if it's over 50, it's one year. Um, so you need to continue to use that. Um, so that's important to stress. So the questions we're often asked is, how do you know if you're in the menopause? Well, that would be, I would say symptoms, um, periods uh, and your age, although age, it can happen earlier. So we have to just keep that one to the side. How long will it last? And that is as long as a piece of string. So it can be for a year or so. It can be no, no time at all, or it can be up to 15, 20 years. And then how does it impact on me? And again, that's really individual. And I'll go through some things in a minute about how we can look at that and what we can do. So my general one is be kind to yourself. If you're experiencing menopausal symptoms, you need to know what these symptoms are so you can work out what's menopausal, what isn't and how you handle it. And just remember that there's one, no one size fits all. So as with everything else, we see so many people that say, I don't want to do that because my friend did that and it didn't work. Or I've tried this and it doesn't work, so I wouldn't recommend it to anyone else. It, it does take trial and error sometimes. And it's exactly the same as it would do with a contraceptive pill if you were taking hormones. You need to try a couple sometimes before you get the right one. And also what my advice is to someone that I see. So in clinic, our youngest person with um, POI in clinic was 14. So um, that's the youngest patient I've seen. And my oldest patient that we've got in clinic still taking hormones is 92. Um, the advice I would give to the 14 year old is very different to the advice I give to the 92 year old. And equally, the advice that the 14 or 20 year olds get varies as we go through their life. So what we tell them would be good for them and what they need to do at certain ages, it, it differs. Um, so it's not a static thing as well, which is important to point out. So the symptoms, this is a depressing bit, I'm afraid. So we'll go through them and we'll try and get rid of them quickly. So about 80% of women suffer symptoms and about 45 find it distressing. And as I said, they can go on for longer. Um, not all women seek treatment, so only about 20%. So this may be because of negative stuff in the press. It may be because they've attempted to get treatment and been told they don't need it it's just what women have and just put up with it so never come back again um, the short-term symptoms of hot flushes and night sweats um, aren't necessarily short term so they can go on for 20 years and if that's 20 years of not sleeping that's not particularly a good health outcome for you and also there's some recent research to suggest if you have quite severe perimenopausal hot flushes and night sweats it may be a precursor and it may be a, an indicator of cardiovascular disease later on so these symptoms might be telling us stuff so there's more work that needs to be done there so we've got we break them down into vasomotor which is the familiar ones the hot flushes the night sweats the palpitations sh shedding, sweating shivering increased pulse feeling faint etc and then the sleep disturbances and then um, leading on from those there's the psychological ones so nervousness anxiety depression um, deterioration in memory um, forgetfulness poor self-esteem some of these link to sleep so if you think about yourself if you've done three or four night shifts maybe and not had a really good sleep you do feel a bit irritable and a bit nervous and a bit fed up um, some of them we can sort out when we sort out the sleep the night sweats but others are there by themselves as well we've got um, the vaginal bleeding so the patterns change as well become irregular become heavier shorter in gaps and then longer in gaps uh, a bit later on, um, both the bladder and the vagina have got estrogen receptors in them. So um, the vaginal tissues get quite thin, you get atrophy there, the secretions change, um, it becomes quite dry. Um, unsurprisingly, sex becomes painful, more prone to infections, more prone to bleeding, um, and then some problems with bladders, so frequency and urgency sometimes as well. And if some of the patients that have really bad atrophy will describe when they tried to have sex, it felt like someone was rubbing ground glass into their vagina. Um, you can imagine that that really doesn't do anything for someone's sex drive. So we have a bit of a pattern going on there, but also the hormones can decrease libido as well. And then the others that I couldn't really fit into a category um, are the skin. Um, skin becomes dry, hair becomes dry. Um, some people say they feel that they've got insects crawling all over their skin um, and we get joint pains, we get bloating, we get weight gain, which is inevitable with the menopause for most people around the middle, um, fatigue. Uh, and so a very happy picture there. So we'll move on from those. Um, so what can we do? So 
diary and tracking. Um, I find this quite useful. Um, some people will find they have a trigger for some of their symptoms, so particularly the hot flushes. So those triggers can be things like caffeine, they can be hot drinks, they can be alcohol. Um, just as a tip, people say that red wine is really bad, but white doesn't seem to be so bad and Prosecco and Champagne are okay, as is gin. <laughs> So just from my speaking to people around, I've collected a little selection of alcohols that seem to be OK. Um, hot drinks, um, eating some people, if you eat late at night and have a big meal, then they're bound not to have a good night's sleep. So we look at the symptoms. We look at what makes it worse, what makes it better. Also track that in line with your periods as well to see what's happening. And then when you know what your symptoms are, don't put up with it, seek support. But it can be really useful because if you can work out your triggers. So when I talk to women with breast cancer who can't take hormones, quite a lot of the time we look at the triggers, we find the triggers. And then if a trigger is red wine, that means probably for some people, if they were out at some function, they might not want a glass of red wine because it would bring on a flush and a sweat. However, if they're sitting at home on a Saturday night watching telly with a fan on in their pyjamas, they might have a glass of red wine because they could cope with it feeling hot. So having the triggers does give a little bit of control although some women don't have any triggers at all and they just come randomly. Longer term symptoms of um, menopause, uh, osteoporosis. So um, as we um, lose estrogen, we lose bone um, and that decreases from about 40 onwards until we hit the menopause when it decreases by, to about five to 6% a year. So you can quickly, if you don't have a good bone density to start with, if you don't look after your bones, you can quickly get into osteoporosis, which in itself may not be so much of a problem until you start falling over. So we look at bones and we look at diet, activity, weight and reducing falls. So what can we do about, it, about all of this? So staying cool. So it's easy to say staying cool, but fans, little desktop fans can be useful. The ability to open a window, which is probably quite impossible working in the NHS, but that can be useful. Looking at the temperature, looking at the clothes that people are wearing. Um, at night time, there's a chiller pillar that can go under your pillow that keeps the back of your head cold. Um, things that are made of bamboo or wick away fibres are quite good at absorbing. So um, bed linen or um, pyjamas or night dresses and stuff. When you have a sweat at night, they tend to absorb the sweat. Um, and so you don't wake up all cold. And then ventilation and fans. Um, some people keep some cold things in the fridge. So some wet, wet wipes and stuff in the fridge or a bottle of cold water, some spritzes. There is something um, called Fizzy Cool, which is a menopausal spray, which is um, just water in a bottle that when you have a flush, you spray it over your chest and um, face and it cools you down. It's designed for women, so it's pink and it's about £15 a bottle. If you look at boots and look at the prickly heat section, you'll find some cold water in a bottle designed for going on holiday when you want to keep cool and it's £2.99, but it's blue. So you really have to look at what's in things um, because menopause is a huge market and it's growing and growing and growing, um, particularly the alternatives and the other things. So it's, it's worth looking at what's in them. But you can make your own spritz up. You could put your own cold water, your own water in, in a spray bottle in the fridge and then use that. In general, so these are my general points about menopausal care and general health. So keep the weight down because we know that people who are overweight have more symptoms. They also have more problems with their heart, their joints, their cancer and the pelvic floor. But we know that the symptoms are, are less if you're not overweight. Alcohol, bad for bones, bad for heart and bad for sleep. So keep that down in, in moderation and yeah, bad for symptoms. Caffeine, again, symptoms and sleep. A good diet. So general overall health as well. Um, decrease the fats and the, increase the proteins. Food with phytoestrogen, so that's plant estrogens, may help. And that's things like chickpeas, um, all the legumes, flax seeds, etc. Omega-3 for skin, joints and mood. Um, sometimes your blood sugar is a bit uncontrollable around the menopause and it can trigger, uh, uh, having a low blood sugar can trigger a flush as well. So try and eat regular meals. And if you're going to snack, snack on um, nuts or something like that or fruit and things. And then I can't say that tripopan serotonin for mood, which is in salmon and fish. Um, move and keep moving. So it's quite tempting not to. But um, as you were saying about walking week, it's really important to walk, really important to move because that's so good for your bones. Um, weight bearing exercise, just walking is really good to keep them strong. Um, we do recommend vitamin D for bones. and Most people are taking that anyway. And then looking at calcium in the diet and magnesium and supplementing if needed. 
Sleep hygiene is important because sleeping can be a problem. So relaxation, go to bed at the same time. All the th normal things, don't have the TV on, don't have phones in the bedroom. Um, there is some CBTI for insomnia as well, which can be quite useful. Smoking, as I've said, bad for everything, but bad for menopause symptoms as well. And smokers have a menopause and can bring a menopause on earlier as well. So um, more incentives to stop smoking makes the flushes worse and makes, makes it come on her earlier. Um, it's really easy to say stress reduces stress, but there are some things that can help. So um, this book, CBT um, for um, Managing Hot Flushes and Night Sweats, was written by Myra Hunter and Melanie Smith. They're both clinical psychologists, and it's written with women with breast cancer in mind. It's a four-week self-help guide to trying to deal with some of those symptoms so it will deal with the hot flushes and night sweats it has information about menopause in there it doesn't help with joint pains and other bit, other things that go with menopause but it can be quite useful it also can help with the anxiety so that's one of the things that i recommend to some people and it helps you reflect on what you can control and what you can't control um and it's important around this time, I mean, for brain fog and for everything else, but to do something new, because that keeps your brain active, that you enjoy. And that's good for um, keeping your brain active and relieving stress as well. So it's important to think of things. So some people say that if you learn a new language or tango dancing, that keeps your brain really active. Um, and the good news is that very dark chocolate is quite good for your brain around this time as well. So you can have a square of very dark chocolate to keep that brain going. So if I'm going on to treatments, we don't be afraid of HRT. There's lots of negative press, um, but you really need to understand that some of those studies that were done and some of the studies that are reported weren't done for menopausal women with menopausal symptoms. They were looking at the primary prevention of HRT on cardiovascular disease and they're used for a completely different population. So we really have to know what's behind them. So don't be afraid of HRT. If you want to try alternatives, some herbal supplements may help. You have to see what's suitable for you because herbal supplements doesn't necessarily mean no risk or harmless. For example, St. John's will, as you probably most people are aware, interferes with the contraceptive pill and can interfere with HRT. Um, people on tamoxifen, so for breast cancer, shouldn't be taking plant-based soya um, medication or plant-based estrogens because that can interfere with the tamoxifen and for lots of these they're sold as a dietary supplement so we don't actually have much evidence behind it but we do say take one product take a pure product so don't take a compound product with lots of different herbs in it think about one pure herbal product take it for three months and see if it helps don't try multiple things because it's very expensive so one of the ones that has got a little bit of evidence is red clover um, and a high dose red clover can help some people with hot flushes and night sweats and then black coal wash as well. Acupuncture, the evidence is mixed, but it's important just to try one thing at a time. Otherwise, you could end up spending a lot of money. There's prescribed medication. Now, these are second line treatments, so they shouldn't be prescribed. But very scarily, a lot of women with menopausal symptoms go to their GP and get prescribed antidepressants because that's familiar and that doesn't treat things um, as well as HRT, but they get antidepressants. But we can use these clonidine, um, or some of the antidepressants and gabapentin second line. And they help about 30 to 50 percent of women that use them. And we use them for people with um, hormone dependent cancers that can't take HRT or people that really don't want to take HRT. But they're not our first line treatments because of the side effects. And because, again, they only will deal with hot flushes and night sweats they don't deal with joints they don't deal with heart and um, protecting the heart etc or bones so alternatives what's in them do they work are they really good and how much does it cost so it's important to know that keep those questions in mind when you're going to look at different things and then this is my little screenshot down the bottom of all the different alternatives that there are around and as you can see or oh, there is one there's Two blue, just a pink and purple, because obviously we menopausal women like the pink and purple. Um, so most of those are plant-based estrogens. Um, acupuncture um, seems to have mixed reviews, but some people say it really does help. Then there's a whole list of herbs there. So there's soya, um, different vitamins, black cowash, angus, castus, etc., that can help, and people do take them. So, but again, my advice would be: so if I was dealing with someone who's in their thirties and they've got POI, I don't suggest alternatives or herbal because they're not going to it's not going to protect their bones and it's not going to protect their heart if i'm dealing with someone who's 51 52 with some hot flushes and they want to know what what alternatives to take then they've got the free range of taking anything they need to so we have to put it into context as what we're trying to treat and what symptoms we're trying to get on top of hrt 
So HRT is defined by the content, so what's in it, and the delivery method. So as the basics, if you have um, your uterus, if you've not had a hysterectomy, you need uh, combined HRT, which would be estrogen every single day, and then progestogen, either sequential, so you have that for um, 12 to 14 days a month and have a bleed after that, or continuous, so estrogen progestion every day with no bleed. So the sequential is for perimenopausal women and the continuous is for those that have stopped their periods for a year. If there's no uterus, then estrogen only can be given because the progestin's job is just to protect the um, endometrium from the estrogen. And um, estrogen only HRT has a lower risk of breast cancer. Um, so it's a safer method. If people have had a hysterectomy, but they've left the cervix behind or they've had endometriosis in the past, then we might need to give them combined HRT, but we'd need to monitor that separately. So we would give HRT for hot flushes, night sweat, mood changes, um, vaginal dryness, etc. We give the progestion just for the endometrial protection and we do give testosterone for mood changes, decreased libido and lack of energy. Um, so we the full range is. Um, HRT is also um, protects your bones and protects your heart when given at the right time. So women have um, uh, less risk of heart disease before the menopause and after the menopause it rises, but estrogen can help pre to prevent that. So the types of HRT we've got, we've got transdermal patch um, preparations. And so that's the patch. Um, so um, that goes on twice a week, anywhere from the waist down or the gel. Um, the gel is put on to your arms or legs in the morning or at night. Um, the gel, um, so the patches are quite useful. You change them twice a week. Um, they can leave a bit of a skin irritation. So some people don't like that. And they are a visible reminder. The gel, um, you spread it on and you have to wait to dry. So you have to wait to dry for about five to 10 minutes while you've got the gel on in the morning and you can't have contact with another human being or get dressed or dry it with a hair dry because that doesn't work. It inactivates the alcohol in it and it makes it not work. So it's, it can be quite time consuming. More recently, there's um, a product on there called Lenzetto, which is a spray. So it's a transdermal spray and you spray it onto your forearm, um, normally one to three pumps of that um, is sprayed onto the forearm. So that's estrogen only and that can be quite useful as well. So we suggest transdermal preparations because they avoid the liver. So you get a more stable dose. Um, it's a lower dose because it avoids the liver. And um, there seems to be reduced or in no incidence of blood clots with those as well. So it's, fair, it's safer for people that may have slight increased risks. Tablets we use um, and we, they do slightly increase risk of, uh, the risk of blood clots, um, but we would do that by looking at someone's uh, underlying medical conditions, but some of them can lower cholesterol. So there's pros and cons for each of them. And again, if I saw someone in clinic who was 51, 52, fit and healthy, um, non-smoker, no risk factors, they would be able to choose whether they wanted tablets or whether they wanted to take transdermal. If I saw someone in clinic who had a slightly raised BMI, was a smoker and diabetic, I would suggest they had a transdermal because that would be um, better for them. So it depends on underlying medical conditions as to where we go. So I've said about the regimes with a womb, HRT regimes with a womb. Um, so the, the other one is a quarterly regime where you have some progestion every three months and then have a big bleed after that for people that are a bit insensitive to progestogen. So the myths that you find is HRT causes breast cancer. Um, that HRT is linked with breast cancer and may promote breast cancer, but whether it actually causes it to start um, in the beginning is still debatable, but there is an increased risk of breast cancer if you're on HRT, a combined one, for a longer time. HRT causes blood clots, but doesn't if you are using the patch or the gel. HRT is dangerous. Well, it's no more dangerous than any other medication that you would give. If you've ever read the packet of paracetamol and the insert for that, then you'll find quite a lot of serious side effects and risks with that. So it's, it, HRT isn't dangerous if given to the right person at the right time. It doesn't cause weight gain, unfortunately, the menopause does. And I've got no magic answers for you because I wouldn't probably be sitting in my bedroom doing a talk if I had. Um, if you're on HRT, you can't get pregnant and it's not a contraceptive, so it's not like the pill. It doesn't stop you ovulating if you are going to ovulate, so you need to use contraception as well. Natural methods are not necessarily take safer. And there's some old uh, um, evidence, there's old guidance that says you can only take it for five years, which is rubbish. And the latest guidance says you can take it for as long as you need to for the symptoms you've got at the lowest dose possible. So there's no arbitrary take it for five years and stop. So this is a quite a good chart from um, 
the British Menopause Society and Women's Health Concern, and it look, outlines the risk of breast cancer because that's the thing that everyone always says about the risk of breast cancer. And you can see there's four additional um, cases of breast cancer for women on HRT if it's combined therapy on the background of 23 um, per thousand. But if we look down the chart, people that drink more than two units of alcohol a day have an extra five cases, and those that are BMI over 30 have an extra 24 cases. But exercise can help and again national walking week exercise etc um, can help to reduce that risk so it all needs to be put into context um, and actually the um, four the four cases is exactly the same as the pill and I don't think many people get told that when they start the pill but we focus quite a lot on it um, with HRT so the disadvantage of HRT so the breast cancer as I've covered before clotting is um, a, a low risk compared to the pill and to, compared to pregnancy low risk of strokes if you're on the, um, the patches or the gel. The side effects, so those can be nausea, breast tenderness, um, feeling a bit sick when you first start on it, and then bleeding. So lots of people do have some irregular bleeding to start with that should settle down, but sometimes it just takes a little bit of perseverance to get there. Quickly move on to treatments for vaginal dryness and painful sex. So we've got vaginal estrogens. So if we use vaginal estrogens, we use them as either a gel or a tablet or a ring. Um, and they're put into the vagina every night for two weeks, then twice a week. If you use this for a year, it is the same as using one day's worth of oral HRT. That's how much estrogen you get. So a year's worth of vagina equals one day of HRT. So it's a tiny, tiny amount. So there's very few people that can't use these. Um, they can be very useful if it's painful um, and for bladder problems as well. Sometimes the frequency gets better and for repeat infections because it just puts the estrogen back in there and then gets the flora and the fauna all all, all nice again so um, it stops um, some of the infections like thrush etc so they can be very useful and we do use those quite a lot if you read the packet for it though you'd think you're probably about to die by opening the box because the packet is written for systemic estrogen so the packet says you're going to get a blood clot cancer a breast um, breast cancer a heart attack and die just by opening it but actually none of that's true so when we do prescribe you do need to say to people ignore that and look at the actual leaflet that um, comes about the product. If people don't want to use hormones, then we do have lubrication. So we've got Yes, um, which comes as a um, vaginal moisturizer, which um, as a tip is very good as a hand cream as well if um, people are washing their hands quite a lot. So the vaginal moisture works well for that. Um, and then it um, and they also have um, an oil based and a water based. Um, uh, uh, creams and things for when you have sex. Um, there's lots of companies that do them. So lubricants are just for sex and moisturizers are um, more for uh, just like you would moisturize your skin. So people can use those. And then lubricants can also be used um, at other times as well. So the oil-based ones obviously last longer than the water-based ones, but there's a whole range out there from the companies. Testosterone, very quickly. Um, we use testosterone. We don't have a licensed product for it. It is in the NICE guidance that you can use testosterone if you want to. There's different ones around, but what we're using is products designed for men and we're adapting them to use for women. So it's normally a little bit of them that we use and that is quite good for um, sex drive and for being tired and brain fog as well. And it helps with the estrogen um, absorption in some people. So we do use those. Um, so my resources, I've got Manage My Menopause, which is a website where you put in your details and you get a printout out, the Daisy Network for Young People, Menopause Matters, which is the page, uh, which is um, all online. It has got adverts, but all the content is clinician run. We've got Women's Health Concern, which is the um, patient arm of the British Menopause Society, and they have a very long list of fact sheets on menopause um, and they're all clinician written so they're all approved. Um, the RCN, as I flagged the RCN, um, we've done lots of publications on menopause so we've got a basic menopause handout, we've got one on being a clinical nurse specialist in menopause, one on mental health and menopause and one on menopause at work so there's quite a few stuff there. The British Menopause Society for Professionals, again they have some good fact sheets and some good handouts and the Faculty of Occupational Medicine has some as well. There's a few references about some work stuff if people are interested in work and um, some from Houston, some from um, NHS employers, etc. And then questions. Thanks for watching this video from the Maternity and Midwifery Forum. For more expert opinion and analysis, hit the button below to subscribe.